Our last speaker today is Mr. Robert Parker, the founder of Nuclear for Climate Australia. Robert spent most of his career doing great things in civil engineering. Um, he's held both the president and the vice president roles of the Australian Nuclear Association and is one of Australia's most active nuclear energy advocates. Uh, today, Rob will address the specifics of the GE Hitachi BWRX300, small modular reactor design, including an overview of timelines, plant design, construction methodologies, operation, plant siting, and project costs. He will also deal the massive, so he will also detail the massive potential that exists for Australia and Canada to team up as Commonwealth partners in the deployment of this power plant. Um, over to you, Rob. Thank you for that introduction, Joan. It's lovely to see my fellow members of the Australian Nuclear Association here tonight, and thank you for coming out. I must say the trip we took, the four of us took to Canada, greatly exceeded my expectations. Um, I will mention in passing that some years ago I got interested in this BWX300 plant, but also I'm going to give a big shout out to a gentleman who's now a good friend of mine in Toronto, is Dr Chris Kiefer, who runs the Decouple podcast. If you're a bit of a fan for podcasts, I recommend you listen to Chris because he's been a staunch advocate of nuclear, not only in Canada, uh, he's a an emergency physician there and he works all sorts of hours but he went over to Europe to try to uh, uh, get the Germans to see another path. He didn't necessarily have much success but all power to him for trying. So uh, I recommend that and, and it was Chris's efforts on his podcast that actually did the link for me mentally between Canada and the BWX 300. So today I'm going to talk about cost I'm also going to talk up about the teaming, but uh, the other speakers have spoken a fair bit about that. I'm certainly not going to repeat myself. Uh, we'll talk about the innovations in the construction of the BWX300, and we'll talk about its safety case. OK. On this slide, <clears throat> In the modelling that Robert Barr just showed you, we have settled on a cost that we're tending to use for our modelling in comparison to renewable schemes in, in arriving at an optimum mix for Australia. So Robert's model is rather wonderful in that you can put uh, amounts for the transmission, you also put your emissions intensities and you can put in different costs. But the model also adjusts that, of course, for the capacity factors that are internally determined to increase or reduce the cost. So I guess you understand the impact of capacity factors. When people talk about LCOE, it's also intimately matched to the capacity factor. If you drop the capacity factor, your LCOE goes up, it, it, but it automatically sorts itself out in the model. Now, what we're putting into the models uh, at present um, is we've got in this case, for generic small modular reactors in Australia, a figure of about $7,375 per kilowatt electrical. You might think that's a little bit high, but I'll explain something about that in a minute. We've got a weighted average cost of capital of 6%, but the model can take any, any amount. But that's a fairly representative amount that you can rely on for the planning purposes. And that feeds out when you take the fueling and you put people in it, and for the case, for example, of the BWX300, you're talking probably about a group of about 100 people operating that plant. And we get an LCOE at 95% capacity factor of $78.24 per megawatt hour. As I said, that is for a generic case of a small modular reactor. Robert Barr also showed you a slide which had the amount of nuclear sitting in the grid. You remember, I might remember that one that had the all blue area with the solar above. Well, that corresponds to 76% nuclear in our system and 17% solar and 7% hydro. And that comes up variously around about 22 grams of carbon. And that's about the optimum. It also translates 
for the national electricity market to about 24 gigawatts of nuclear capacity. Now, what we're seeing, of course, now is that we've got different systems developing in Australia, transmission expansions. We've got VNI West, which is occurring to connect the snowy down into Victoria to get greater power distribution down into Victoria. And we've got Murray Link sitting in uh, New South Wales. And these schemes are going to enable a transfer of power between New South Wales and Victoria in the region of um, two gigawatts. Now, when you therefore have this ability to combine the two states' resources, you end up with a sum total of around about 18 gigawatts of capacity shared between the two states. That's an important number because when we think of nuclear, we can, of course, use an all SMR system. We could use all SMRs at 24 gigawatts, and if you back divide by 0.3, hey presto, you'll get about 88. And you'll think, Jesus, that's a lot. That's 88 plants. Well, you might also think that we could use a hybrid system, which might have some large, some small. And if you can translate those sorts of energies and you get a large plant drop off the grid, well, you have enough reserve capacity with about 28 gigawatts to make up for that amount. So we can look quite sensibly at the opportunities for an all SMRs fleet or we can look at some hybrid, hybrid, hybrid form. Now we've discussed quite, at, quite uh, at length already why Canada, so I'm not going to rehash this, um, except to say that the Polish people, for the same reason that we've already advocated, and I'll just read this part in red here, the CEO of Synthos Green, that's the Polish um, CEO who's looking at putting in 10 of these plants in Poland, said the fact that the BWX300 technology has been chosen by experienced utilities from Canada, the country with, me, with decades of experience in the nuclear business, confirms that we have made the right decision and we're on the right track. Working with the Canadian entities such as Laurentis Energy Partners will allow us to learn from the first planned BWX deployments in the world. Um, Laurentis Partners is an interesting firm that we met. They're a wholly owned subsidiary of Ontario Power Generation. And they're the marketing arm, if you like, of Ontario Power Generation. These are the people, for example, if we choose to go down this route that we would probably be dealing with. It's actually headed up by a gentleman we met there, or his operations officer is actually a, an Australian guy who's worked for um, Origin for a decade. So he's very familiar with our operations in Australia. And they also market uh, radioisotopes and industrial material. I won't go through this anymore because we've heard enough about that. So I'll dive right now to the technical details of this BWX300 plant. In this image, we see that basic the power block, that's the, the building, down on the bottom right we've got a two pack, top left we've got a single pack. The power block is 140 metres by 70 metres. It's a low-rise building, or low-rise in terms of it being about 20 metres high, which is not particularly high, it's probably about the size of a Bunnings or something. Its EPZ is expected, it's in back, I hate that term said, EPZ is expected to be at the site boundary when it's finally licensed. Many of you you may have seen this image before. On the left hand side, that's a pretty conventional building. That is a simple industrial building. It doesn't need to necessarily be nuclear rated. It's a, it's a turbine building with the 300 megawatt off the shelf turbine. It's not a particularly fancy turbine. 300 megawatts is a fairly modest size. The lower floors contain the incoming nuclear fuel and also mechanical facilities for the operations. On the right hand side, 
that's the control room and the admin area for the reactor. And sitting in the middle there, well, that's what we call the nuclear island, and that's where things get serious in terms of the quality of construction. Sitting in the middle of that cylinder, we have the reactor pressure vessel. That device is 29 metres high and of the order of 3 metres in diameter. And sitting down at the bottom of that, towards the bottom anyway, is the, re is the actual reactor itself. At 29 metres high, it's, it is quite a tall device and we're going to discuss a bit more about that shortly. About 40 metres of that 60 metre height is actually built in ground. So most of the RPV is sitting in ground. And above the reactor pressure vessel, you'll see in blue, that's the, the, the water storage which is actually the storage device which enables any decay heat. Um, should there be a, a loss of coolant accident occur, that's where the decay heat ends up. We're going to talk a bit more about that later. The devices up the top in yellow, they're the polar crane for refueling uh, the plant. Up to the right-hand side of that pool is a zone where uh, used nuclear fuel is stored temporarily. And the rest of the floors in that building are used for various things such as water treatment and uh, purification for use within the plant. In a lot more detail now, we're going to talk about the innovations which have made this plant such a successful device because this 95% of the equipment in this plant is currently out there operating in other, other plants around the world. So there's only a small component of this. They've taken the best of other plants, put them together in a re reduced size. And so in this plant, they've actually got a 50% reduction in the materials per megawatt hour, per, sorry, per megawatt of other plants. So they've significantly reduced the materials usage in this plant compared to all other nuclear plants. We have... Sorry about that. I'm doing well here. Okay. The vertical walls and the horizontal floors are built using a composite structure of steel and concrete. It's called the steel bricks technology. And I'll come to that now. This is all right. The method of actual construction of that cylinder in the ground is pretty straightforward. The technology, well, I've built structures like this in Australia. They're actually large um, sewage reservoirs that we often have in urban environments. Not much different to this. We use the same construction technique. In these facilities, you imagine you've got a site close by um, a river or an estuarine area where you want to draw on water for cooling. And typically on the east coast of Australia, you're going to have overlying alluvium, and below that you're going to have rock. And so what we do, first stage, we go in and we construct a ring, what we call a slurry wall, or we use um, secant piles, which you often see in high-rise buildings constructions in Australia when we build the deep basement. So we, we build for the first... 20 metres or so, we put those secant piles of slurry walls down. Then we go down into conventional rock excavation, and then once we've got to the base of that excavation, we then put a mud mat, in, mud mat of concrete in to seal the base, and then we come up and we waterproof the walls, and then we get to the stage where we can start to put in the steel bricks. So on the left-hand side, you've got an excavator in there doing the excavation, then when they get down to the base, they start to put these steel bricks, which have been assembled like a Lego system. And they load those in by crane, and hey presto, you've got what you see on the bottom right-hand side, which is the composite steel structure. Now, those steel structures are open, just like that. So you've got an inner and outer um, steel face, 
with what we call shear keys in the middle, and they fill that full of concrete. And so that becomes your structural... Sorry, Joe, five minutes. Thank you. And so that becomes uh, the structure of our device. We've then got to actually turn that into something useful because we've got the internal floors and we've got the walls. And so we have to have, as we see in this image, vertical walls with horizontal connectors. And so what they're doing now is they're testing those to make sure they meet the seismic loads and all of those loads that this plant could be subjected to. They've got to make sure, for example, when they pump the concrete in there, that the thing is actually homogeneous. Why are they doing all that? Well, this eliminates conventional formwork and reinforcement fixing. It becomes very much a Lego block build. That's how you build the thing quickly. But one of the most innovative parts of this is the thing called, that addresses the loss of coolant accident. It's this integral operating valve which sits right beside the nuclear plant. So imagine off the steam line or the return line going off to the turbine, you get a break. Wouldn't it be a good idea if you had a valve sitting right at the reactor pressure vessel which automatically closes? So that's what happens here. Those valves close when such a locker is detected and retain the water, or as much as they can, within the reactor pressure vessel. That idea, hold that for a minute, works in concert with another one of the innovations of this plant. On the right hand side we have the reactor pressure vessel of the BWX300. It's got a 10 metre extension, 10 metres higher than the ones on the left. That's to enable and to eliminate the primary coolant pumps. So they've put a core in there to assist it driving natural circulation to keep the plant cool. When they put those bits of kit together, the isolation valves, the natural circulation, they come now to how you actually get the passive cooling system to work for this. In the event of a loss of coolant accident, those valves would close off the defective lines that have broken, other valves will open and enable water to flow up out of the top of the reactor pressure vessel up into the water above, where it's condensed and then it flows back down into the reactor where it turns into steam and then that water flows back up through the reactor, back up into the pond at the top, where condensers take that water and disperse it through the, um, the pool. That mechanism enables them to get rid of decay heat for a period of seven days, then they replenish the pond. And they've, they've got about three circuits, but only one is required to enable this device to cool itself for seven days. Putting it all together, therefore, it's a very simple reactor that contains three major components. Natural circulation, plus the integral isolation strategy, plus the isolation condenser system. All three of those innovative parts combined together give you a very simple safe reactor that has also pulled 50% of the equipment out. And you need to in a small modular reactor because you've got a heck of a lot of fixed costs compared to large plants that make, them, make their cost case uh, somewhat problematic. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you.